A psychological thriller that, while it's far from a masterpiece, I'd maintain is rather better than it's usually given credit for. Alice is an American who's been in London these past two years working as a designer of CD-ROMs and websites for corporate clients. For six months now she's lived with her boyfriend, Jake, in a relationship that's become affectionate and comfortable, albeit no longer fiery. One day on the way to work she accidentally touches fingers with a mysterious stranger, mountaineer Adam Tallis, at a pedestrian stop sign, and there's an instant attraction. Soon they're in a taxi to the apartment where he's living and in fact his sister's and once they get there, they promptly engage in mad, wild, frenzied, gymnastic, exuberant, passionate, you guessed it. That night, having resolved never to repeat the indiscretion, she attempts to kindle the same fires with Jake, but to no Vela and a couple of evenings later, while the poor guy is attempting to watch the football on the telly, she announces she's going to leave him, cruel timing on her part as she could at least have waited until the match was over. It's not so many days later that she and Adam decide impulsively to marry. Although she knows little about him, Adam does have a fairly dramatic backstory. He's widely regarded as a hero because on his last trip to the Himalayas, he managed to save six of his companions in the wake of a terrible accident. One of the companions who didn't survive was a climber called Francois Collet, with whom he admits he was in love. Others who have climbed with him include Klaus, has written a book about the Ilstart expedition, and Deborah. Adam's sister Ao and Alice first meets Deborah. There's an awkward interval before she learns that Deborah isn't another girlfriend. Deborah has a gray cat called Mr. Noidal who looks very much like the one currently snoring softly on top of my printer. Alice's best friend Sylvie tries to persuade her that she's making a terrible mistake or that she's abandoning real love for the sake of obsessive sex, but Alice doesn't care. Much later, when Alice tries to contact Jake, she discovers that Sylvie has moved in with him of the last two people from her old life upon whose friendship she might have counted are now lost to her. Adam and Alice are married in a remote church in Cumbria afterwards he leads her on a long hike to an even remoter cottage where they're to spend their honeymoon but not before he's snatched the opportunity to photograph her naked in front of a stone angel in the local cemetery. At the cottage, their wild lovemucking takes a turn toward the kinkyo and soon we'll be given the impression that their married love life includes a fair amount of rough stuff. Strange anonymous notes start arriving for Alice, warning her that she knows far too little about Adam and that he has a history of violence. Then a Guardian reporter, join a noble. Alice met while Adam was being interviewed by her, phones to let her know that she or join and has received a weird fax. This is from one Michelle Stowe who claims Adam raped her when she was a teen. Pretending to be Joanna, Alice interviews the woman and is unconvinced by her story. But she's more alarmed when she comes across a stash of love letters Adam has hidden behind lock and key, love letters from one of Elle Blanchard, and the last of which she tells him she's leaving him to return to her husband. Alice tracks down Adele's mama Markimo, who tells her Adele has been missing without explanation for the past eight months, so even more alarming. Among Adele's effects is a photo of her posing naked in front of that very same stone angel in Cumbria. By now Alice is fairly convinced Adam is a multiple murderer that he kills any woman who rejects him. Adam's response to her suspicions is to tie her to the kitchen table or which is I'm sure what we'd all do under the circumstances of but she escapes and enlisting Deborah's help heads for Cumbria. There are some fairly ludicrous moments during the movie, but the general quality of the production and in Patrick Dole's urgent soundtrack who carried me past those moments. The Danemon in Cumbria, however, was so marred by its implausibility that it was hard to keep my disbelief suspended. I can't detail to many of them here without blowing the entirety of the plot's underpinning, but here's one in the depths of winter. Ground is rock hard, so that if you plunge your spade into it you're likely to pull muscle rather than see the blade cleave down into the moist softer. There are plenty of other oddities, despite being a world-famous mountaineer, whose life must sometimes depend upon his respiratory system. Adam smokes like a chimney. I've actually run into a couple of world-famous mountaineers, and unless I'm misremembering they regarded smoking as an absolute no-no. Alice and Adam keep their underwear and at the oddest of moments. Office Potato Alice gets into a fight with a lady mountaineer and holds her own pretty well in real life. Mountaineers are strong and mountaineers are fit as and demonstrates fairly early in the movie when he quite easily chases down and beats nearly to death a much larger man who has attempted to mug Alice and it seems to be entirely optional whether or not Alice goes to work. Not only does her boss not seem to mind her frequent absenteeism, 
He hands her a key assignment. These are mild bloopers of the sort you expect to find in a direct to a video a dev movie. And it crossed my mind more than once that Killing Me Softly might have been better done as a dev rather than a class like cast theatrical release. For one thing, had it been a dev, it might have been a bit shorter and thereby a bit faster removing although that's a cheap shot, the complaint's not wholly without validity. The sex scenes of the movie doesn't quite fall into the erotic thriller category, but it inches close to it obviously hamper the narrative a bit, but there are other, genuine pacing problems. Again, the cinematography and other production standards make it easy not to notice the occasional lapse in pace, but after the second or third of them I did begin glancing furtively at my watch. Until the final half hour or so, Graham gives a rather one-note performance that in fact works quite effectively as she's a sort of innocent abroad who retains her naivety despite her wild abandon. Only in the final minutes does her character seem to gain any degree of complexity, and even then it's not much. Finis can't work out whether to be Heathcliff or a figure out of melodrama, while Mapalon, as his slightly creepy sister, seems to be going through the motions. There are some nice contributions lower down the cast list, such as those from Bannerman, as the Guardian Hank, Hughes, as the dump boyfriend, and Robbins as the best friend. This is Alice's story or parts of it she narrates in voiceover to a police officer, as in this cinematography emphasizes the fact I lost count of the number of conversations we witnessed looking over Alice's shoulder at the other person. In a way, this makes it easier to forgive some of the movie's improbability, in that this is the way she remembers it rather than the way that in reality it necessarily was. I seem to have been picking all sorts of holes and killing me softly, and there's no way to pretend that this is other than a very flawed movie. On the other hand, despite everything, it functions quite neatly as a piece of entertainment, and maybe that's enough. Thank you for watching this video. If you want more video like this then please, like, share, and subscribe.